All right, everybody, welcome back to Blow the Belt Sports Countdown to Baseball. If you're watching this, there are only two days left until opening day. This is actually the last one that we're filming here. We have a very special guest. It is Emily Nyman, the host of Breaking Balls. Emily, what's going on? Not much. I'm excited for opening day. So we'll get right into it. Uh, start off a little bit about Emily. So if you follow her on Twitter, there is a 100% chance you know she's the biggest Alex Rodriguez fan out there uh, and I think it's kind of a bit unique it's, it's a little bit weird because as a 23 year old Yankee fan there's one World Series team that I know that I grew up watching and that's the 2019 that doesn't happen without Alex Rodriguez yet right. you see slander about him all the time how he's not a true Yankee the, the cheating the steroids whatever it is how did you become one of the few a-Rod defenders because I, I myself I defend A-Rod I, I like him I think it's BS when I see people slander him but at the same time I've just always been a Jeter guy just since I was a little kid I was a Jeter guy but how did you become the A-Rod girl um well if you're asking how I became like an A-Rod fan when I was a kid I used to love King Griffey Jr he was on the Mariners so I loved the Mariners this is when I was like seven or eight years old mm -hmm. A-Rod was on the Mariners around then too and then, you know, when I was like 10, that's when the Yankees became really good. So as a 10 year old, like any 10, any good 10 year old does, I hopped on the bandwagon. Mm -hmm. So I've always loved A-Rod because of that. And I, he's always been public enemy number one, you know, mm -hmm. like even before the steroid stuff came out, people hated him. He was a little off-putting. He was the best. So naturally people hated him. So I've always been defending him. So then when the steroid thing hit, I was like, all right, well, I've already, I'm already in it this long. So I might mm -hmm. as well stick with it. Mm -hmm. absolutely I feel like too like as a Yankee fan now seeing the guys the fan base turns on quickly like right now for me it's Stanton it's like it makes me want to defend that guy that much more just because I feel like it's so misguided like I'm not gonna lie to you if we were sitting here and A-Rod had been inconsistent in every single postseason and he played here 15 years and never won a World Series then yeah I could I could see where maybe some of the hate would come from but he put the team on his back to win them a World Series. Like, I don't know how you could not love A-Rod after 2009. Like, even whatever happened after, you know, the, the steroids again, whatever it is, you got to throw that out the window when the guy legitimately had the best postseason run I've ever seen from a Yankee. Not to mention, he won two MVPs while yeah. he was here. He hit over 300 home runs for this team. Like, mm -hmm. I get, like, Oh, whatever. You know, if you have a, a moral issue with PEDs, whatever, if that's your thing. Mm -hmm. So be it. But people usually don't because then they'll be like, oh, well, he sued the team. And it's like, you don't actually care about that. Mm -hmm. So why do you love Scott Brocious more than you love Alex Rodriguez? Why is he ranking higher on your Yankee, all time Yankee list than literally one of the best Yankees of all time? I get it. He wasn't like a good Yankee, like Derek Jeter was a true Yankee or whatever, but he's still added a lot to the team and the team won a lot during his tenure here because of him no absolutely so another thing you're known for on twitter i think this was the first time i ever saw your twitter account this is before i ever even followed you really knew who you were was the thyro strata tweet from that was like what 2019 i think it was the the yeah. thyro strata was fucking shot mm -hmm. and spent less time on the aisle than jacoby ellsbury uh, so obviously you've had like kind of variations of it since, but one particular interaction I want to ask you about was Hubs stealing your tweet. And not only stealing your tweet, because I think this has happened to all of us where I'm on Twitter so much, my brain is fried. And like, there's probably been times where like I tweeted something that like I saw someone else tweet and I would just be like, oh shit, my bad. He doubled down on the fact that he had not seen the tweet, even despite the fact I remember he had put in his blog saying, great tweet, Emily. So how, how did you take it that he denied copying your tweet even though he had previously acknowledged it. Well, my my issue with it was because whatever, like I I don't actually care. You know, right, I I'm yeah. flattered. Right, right. You know, you think this joke is that funny? Like that's cool. That's I tweeted it because I thought it was funny. So awesome. But he DM'd me to mm -hmm. be like, hey, like I thought at first when I saw it that he was like kind of joking, you know, like tongue in cheek. But then he DM'd me and was like, you know, if if you think that like that's fine, like was being serious about it. And I was like, dude, like. And I was trying to be cool. Like, I don't really care. It's fine. It's whatever. But then he got all serious. So that's when I had to pull the receipts and be like, all right, listen, like, you may not remember 
that quote unquote, but then you did it again, like a year later, at, a few days after I tweeted it. So, and you retweeted it. Right. So you never had anything to say after that. <laughs> so funny. So we'll he get made it on. something it wasn't. I didn't even care that much. I, he, he took it way more serious to care. than you, which was the funny thing. He made like, which I, I feel like usually you would think that it's the person whose tweet was being stolen that would be defensive about it. But he played Mr. Defensive there, which was a little bit, a little bit strange to me. It was very strange, especially because I, someone said something, I think it was Hoodie Glaber. He mm -hmm. tweeted something and, and I said something about it. Just like in a joke, none of us tagged him, Hubs that is. So he must, I don't know if he was searching his name or maybe he follows Hoodie Glaber or whatever, but then he saw it and then commented. So it's like, no one brought you here besides yeah. yourself. Like, we're not trying to get your attention, bro. It's really, yeah. But, <laughs> but I don't yeah. have beef with him. Just no, of course, of course not. <laughs> I just think it's one of those things that's like so funny to look back on, just like how that came about. But so we're, we'll start with MLB here. Something that's been a little bit more recent. I think baseball Twitter as a whole is on the same page that Rob Manfred and the changes he's making are ruining the game. It's an it's a attempt to get casual fans, even though I don't think any of the changes he's making are really going to draw anyone in. And the latest one, or at least the biggest one out of the latest group is – banning the shift. I know where you stand. You're against it. Tell us why you think it would be such a big mistake to ban the shift. Well, if I can be actually pretty honest, I've had a bit of a, um, a change of heart. In the really? Last few okay. weeks. Yeah. That I was vehemently against the shift because I just, I didn't like MLB meddling with strategy. I thought it was a little much, but then it dawned on me that I love the DH and I want the universal DH throughout the league. So there was a time in like the seventies when they first implemented the DH that I'm sure there were a lot of people who felt the way that I do about the shift about the DH. It's going to ruin the game. It's meddling with strategy. But, and I think it's literally the best addition to the game in the last like 40 years. Right. So that sort of had me thinking that it's this change is not going to change the game as much as I think people are hoping it's going to mm -hmm. that the shift isn't why there's a decrease in balls in play. It's because pitching is so good. So as long as guys continue to throw 95 regularly and over 95, I think that you're going to have the same issues with balls in play and strikeouts and lifting the ball and mm -hmm. home runs somehow. That's a problem now. I don't know. Why. Yeah, absolutely. I don't, I think you're right. I don't think you're going to get a guy like Joey Gallo to, to change his approach just because now maybe it's a little bit easier for him to hit a single as if he's going to abandon the launch angle approach and start trying to become a 300 hitter. I like, guess not just not going to happen. So I think you're essentially all you're really doing is you're punishing the DJ LeMay Hughes, the Jeff McNeils, the guys who make it impossible to shift on because they do hit the ball to all fields. So I, I don't think you're, you're right. I don't think you're going to end up with more balls in play. I just think you're going to punish certain hitters who now it's not unique that you can't be shifted against. Right. And if, I mean, nothing shows how, I don't want to say insignificant because I'll get, I'll get hate for that, but for lack of a better term, how insignificant the single is to scoring strategy because mm -hmm. we have now entered a, a era of the game where the defense is willing to give up an easy single mm -hmm. because it's like, all right, good luck. Now you got to push that guy completely around the bases. So yep. good luck doing that with four singles in a row off major league pitching at this level in this point in time. So mm -hmm. I think that right there tells us all we need to know that it's just going to it's not going to help teams score anymore, I don't think. I mean, maybe one run per game, but is that really going to be the difference in the entertainment value, which is what the goal really is, is to make the game more entertaining, not to make winning um, more efficiently, not to try to win more efficiently, rather. No, absolutely not. I think you're right. that Not to, not to say, I think you said it perfectly, not that singles are insignificant, because obviously that's a base runner. You need base runners, but right. – it's not as significant in the same way that people love to glorify a singles hitter, but we'll talk shit on a guy who walks all the time. And it's like, well, are you trying to push these guys up who reach first base a lot or not? So it's, it's a little bit strange to me, but I, I think that, you know, banning the shift, you're right, is not going to have the impact that people want it to have. And also I, I think you had said too, what's the alternative? Like what happens? Like, does the game just stop until they would move a guy out of the position he's playing in? Like, do you, like, does a guy just get first base at a point? Like, I think it's kind of really like just like a clunky process. And I don't think there's any good way to really make it happen. And it's, 
it's not like people say, oh, the shift isn't real baseball. And it's like, well, it is because the positions are just a suggestion. These guys are like, how do people think that the positions came to be? Mm -hmm. They're standing in the place where the majority of the balls are being hit. That's where, that's why the center fielder is where he is, the right fielder, the left fielder. So the defense has been shifting and they settled there because that's where the majority are hit. So to say that, okay, well now they can't move until the ball is hit. It's, it's, I don't know. It's, I feel like old man yelling at cloud when I talk about it though, like saying that I don't want the change. So I'm trying to look at it with a more favorable view, but we can just rest easy that I don't think it's going to make as big a change as people think. Baseball as a whole is just kind of an old man yelling at cloud kind of <laughs> vibe in sport though. You know what I'm saying? So if, yeah, you, really if, if we didn't, we would have three inning games with a runner on second starting every inning. So there's, I feel like there's certain things we need to, we need to protect, but that'll, that'll kind of take me into my next point. Uh, I mentioned how Manfred has made a lot of changes or at least some that he's trying to implement and they all revolve around speeding the game up so we're, there's some that we saw they're keeping this year with the seven inning double headers runner on second uh you know pitch clocks are a thing we might see in the future and I'm just not a fan of this entire concept that if we shorten games by 15 or 20 minutes we're going to bring in a bunch of new fans as if a, a two hour 45 minute baseball game is something someone would sit down and watch but they can't deal with three hours so are there any of these rule changes that you like and would actually keep or are you just kind of an if it's not broke don't fix it proponent of the game I mean it's for the same reason that I think that I wish they wouldn't do it because I think that it's not actually gonna like you were saying affect like the amount of fans that the game is able to draw um I I kind of don't care if they do because of that that I don't think it's really gonna have that big of an effect so mm -hmm. if they want to do it Sure, I think that I'm not even going to notice because the amount of time it takes between a lot of these activities, you know, the pitching changes, whatever, mm -hmm. it's being done within that same time frame. But now because there's a clock on it that we're watching, it seems like it's being rushed. But if that clock weren't there, we wouldn't even notice that this is the amount of time that it's taking to do this. So I think that it won't even affect the game as much as the fans at home are thinking. Like, again, that's and that's why I think major league baseball just beats around the bush with these things and mm -hmm. they try them see if it changes anything but it doesn't really because changing things would be changing the game a lot pushing mm -hmm. the mound back lowering the mound like those are things that would have a profound effect on the game immediately so they don't really want to do that because they risk losing a lot of fans in the process possibly mm -hmm. yeah no absolutely i i just think for some of these changes i don't think they're doing much to affect a the game itself and b you know, the, the viewer watching experience. I'm all for changes that can make the game kind of run more smoothly. Like one that kind of flew under the radar that I actually really do like, and it took me maybe a year to realize how much I like it, is the limiting the mound visits. Like nothing was more annoying than a catcher going to the mound three times in an inning because they couldn't get the signs right. Like that's on you. Like if you can't figure that out at a certain point. But is there anything that you would implement? Like if you were, I'm going to give the, the old lame, you know, principal for a day, commissioner for a day question, what would you do? Like, what would be your first order of business? It could be something on the field. It could be something in terms of, you know, your promotion of the game. What would you do besides make Alex Rodriguez your number two? Man, <laughs> what would you open up with? Like, all right, I as commissioner, I'm going to change these things. Well, the easiest thing, if I can make this a two-parter, the mm -hmm. easiest thing would be universal DH. I would do that day one. And then I think the more difficult thing would be one time like one and done domestic violence situations that like if you get popped for domestic violence like you're out of the league for good a ban so the, i think that would be more difficult to implement but the universal dh right away and then that one also but i no, think i'd absolutely. get more pushback mm -hmm. no, believe it or not <laughs> crazy <laughs> enough <laughs> no absolutely i mean universal dh i think that's something that i i I shouldn't say everyone can get behind. I like assume everyone wants it. And then you realize there's still people pushing for like the strategy of it or because Bartolo Colon hit a home run like five years ago. So I, I shouldn't say everyone's behind that one. I do have a theory on that though, because I've seen my own cousin slash co-host, John Snyder. I've mm -hmm. seen his evolution as a DH hater into a DH tolerator slash kind of like it now. Mm -hmm. When National League fans, when their team is really shitty and they don't really have much of a great outlook as far as being 
uh, over 500 team or even in the playoffs, their fans like the strategy of having pitchers hit. They like the novelty of having pitchers hit. The one-off home run, they like that. And it's because I've decided that they don't have anything else to look forward to, so they need that like sort of campy excitement. But then as soon as their team is really good, suddenly they want a better bat in the lineup and they care right. more about their team and their lineup being better than they care about the novelty of you know, a fat pitcher hitting a home run one time in his career. I actually never looked at it that way. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. I think because, you know, that's not really one of the ones that I'm necessarily as vocal about. I absolutely think the Universal DH does make the game better. But at the same time, I'm a fan of an American League team. All I've ever known is a DH. So obviously that seems like a no-brainer to me, but I don't want to tell someone else how to consume their baseball team. Yeah, I mean, I will absolutely tell other people how to consume their business. Yeah, that's, yeah, obviously, that's the way good. I consume mine is the best. <laughs> that's a good point. That's a great – yeah, no, you're, you're not <laughs> wrong. I guess I try and look at it through the, the lens of the National League fan, but no, of course we both know that we're right, that the DH exactly. is superior. So <laughs> I was actually listening to your guys' pod today. Uh, congrats on 52 episodes. That's huge. Thank you. Um, so you guys had a little kind of old takes exposed section. And one of yours was that baseball wasn't going to be played in 2020. And I actually thought, you know, at the time there, I feel like I, I said that thought that, you know, multiple times there were months on end where I thought the two sides were, were too far apart. Um, and I think that even though, you know, it was only a 60 game season and people on the outside looking in might say, Oh, was different without fans, you know, whatever. I think it was huge that they played last year because if baseball was the only sport to not come back after the pandemic, I think that would have been a huge blow to public perception, maybe even more so than if there is a labor stoppage after this season. Uh, so all that being said, where do you think baseball is right now, just in terms of popularity? Because we know that fans like you and I are going to watch it, consume it, no matter you know what happens, what goes down. But in the eyes of everyone else, because I know the baseball is dying narrative always goes on, where do you think Major League Baseball is? Um, I think that they're probably status quo. I think their biggest hurdle is um, the lack of personality in the game. They're, they don't really – they should market regionally, and they don't really do that. They market – well, they don't really market, but the players that they do, you know, because of their blackout restrictions, why would they market Tatis Jr. up in the Northeast or anywhere besides Southern California knowing full well that – unless you have an MLB package, you can't watch that player. Mm -hmm. So, and they do that on purpose, right? Because they want to try to incentivize getting MLB TV, I'm sure, but it's not cheap. So a lot of people can't afford it. So someone said this on Twitter and I can't remember who I wish I could at the moment, but they said to grow, to grow the game, you have to show the game. Mm -hmm. So I think that if anything, they're just, sitting maybe even maybe a little under because of 2020 and you fall off from that but until they have the they get rid of the blackout restrictions I mean I don't really see how they can possibly grow the game unless they start change drastically changing the rules and making it more like the sports where you can change possession on a dime like mm -hmm. every other pro sport right I think one thing that I've been kind of a proponent of and it's tough because in some ways it's almost not really baseball because obviously, you know, baseball is sitting down watching a nine inning game. You know, there's the, the nuances of it, you know, that a real baseball fan knows, you know, the, the importance of, you know, the count and runners on and, you know, who's up in the bullpen and things like that. But I feel like someone watching it for the first time, isn't really going to care. You know, they want to know when Aaron judge is that bad or if Jacob DeGrom has a no hitter going. So I, I feel like if they, had some kind of alternate presentations, like a little bit more of like a whip around style broadcast where they're going to, to live look-ins of, oh, this guy's on my fantasy team. You know, I have money on this game. I think that could be a way where you're not touching how the game is played at all, but at the same time, some guy who's like, you know, I'll consume 45 minutes of baseball tonight and can look at it and be like, you know what, that was actually kind of exciting. I think that that's a great idea. And they, for me anyway, they proved that that model works because if, you remember for the playoffs last year, that wild card round, because they expanded the playoffs, there was like that one day or those two days that had like, like 15 games or something. It's yeah, crazy. It awesome. And MLB network had like the, almost like a red zone situation where they would show a game and they'd switch, like jump around if there was runners in scoring position or whatever. And it was awesome. So mm -hmm. I, if they did that, that would be awesome, especially for a game that, it's tough to get fans to watch every game because it's 
162 of them, you know, mm -hmm. football has scarcity. So that's why they get so many fans to watch, but exactly. baseball, they struggle to, but something like that, I think would get a little, a lot more eyes on the game on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, hopefully they can come up with something like that. I have very little faith that they'll actually implement it, okay. but listen, we'll, we'll see. Trying to stay optimistic. Too uh, good of an idea. Not yeah, good. no, exactly. It makes too much sense. They'll probably just add in like a, like a second pitcher hitting or something like that. But <laughs> So you're a Yankee fan as well. What's your honest expectation for the team this year? Do you think they're going to get it done? And what's, you know, what's the X factor in that besides health? Cause I think that's kind of, you know, everyone knows we need to stay healthy, but if you had to bring it down to one thing, one guy, what do they need to reach their ultimate goal? I think that they are world series or bust that they are more than capable of making it there and winning it. Um, I think that, the key will be Aaron Judge and Giancarlo Stanton, or even one or the other. That's how good they both are individually. That if they're on and they play more than 100 games each, mm -hmm. it's going to be, I think, and, and obviously that includes healthy going into the playoffs. I think that this team is going to be tough to beat. Mm -hmm. I think Stanton needs, I, I keep saying this. And Stanton, to me, is very comparable to A-Rod as a guy who came in having already won MVPs elsewhere. You know, he's a, he's a Hall of Fame track player. I think it, people can kind of forget it just because we haven't really seen much of him over the last two seasons. The guy, when he's on the field, is incredible. We just saw that in the postseason. So, you know, he has the big contract. You know, he's not, a, like you said earlier, necessarily a true Yankee because he's not a homegrown guy. Like, I think the fans even give Judge more of a pass for his injuries just because he came up with us one rookie of the year here. But if Giancarlo Stanton does what he did last postseason and route to a World Series, no one would or should care what they're paying him for the next eight years. No one should care. That should, no. The contract is worth it to me. If he does that, I'm cool with him forever. And also, I mean, because of the, you know, a lot of the, the Stanton haters, they tend to have a very much like postseason is the only thing that matters. Regular season doesn't mm -hmm. matter attitude. So even if, like last year, if he – if he was on the IL for the entire year and then was healthy for the playoffs and performed like that, that should be all it takes too. Yep. They shouldn't be complaining about him being injured anymore because they've implied that all those 162 games don't matter. So mm -hmm. if a player is on the IL most of it and they make it to the playoffs anyway, and then they go off, you should now love him. No, you're yeah. right. Because if he played 155 games, you know, in the regular season, hit 55 bombs, won the MVP, but the Yankees get bounced in the ALDS and he's like two for 16, then yeah, you, they would be saying the regular season doesn't matter. So right. it, if the Yankees just need to win, that's what it comes down yes. to. No one's going to be happy unless the Yankees win. So, yeah. and, and you and me, you or me either, we'll probably give him a little bit more credit where it's due than some other people, but I don't think we're going to be sitting here a year from now and say, oh, well, at least he played well and, you know, all shucks. So, you know, it's, no, it's really it's put true. up or shut up time for this team. So totally just to true. wrap up, I said how you've been doing breaking balls for a year now. It's awesome. One of the more you know popular pods out there. I don't be Twitter. You should go give it a listen after you listen to or watch this. What's your ultimate goal with the pod? Like, where do you see it going or growing? Do you have any any plans for it, or is it just kind of a thing where you're recording it every week and you'll just see what happens? Um, I don't know where it's going you know so far it's been going really good people seem to like it and like to listen to it and think it's funny and um you know i'm fortunate that all three of us are we have day jobs so we mm -hmm. do the we started as a hobby and it's a passion so it would be amazing if it took us somewhere and we could eventually do it for a living but for now it's just it's a it's something i look forward to every single week and i work on it really hard and spend a lot of hours on it when I'm not at my regular job and it's just a really awesome creative outlet. And I just hope that it continues to be, and I no, can, just, it's can awesome. just do our own thing and just keep on doing our own thing. Well, can't wait to see what you guys come up with for the season. Uh, Emily Nyman, thank you so much for joining me. Go follow her on Twitter at M. She does it. Listen to breaking balls pod. Anything else you want to, you want to plug? No, just you can find us on Twitter also at Break Balls Pod, and we have a new episode every Saturday. Go Yankees. Awesome. Emily, thank you so much. Opening day, two days away, guys. Get excited. Uh, let's go Yankees, baby. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much.